Okay, so we are right at 11 o'clock. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. For everyone that's on the for the webinar today, if you could please mute your microphone, that'd be really appreciated. Um, we'll have a chance to ask any questions that you have using the chat feature, but we will not use the microphone. Please make sure that you're muted. You should have uh, so thank you everyone for attending. Uh, the, the name of our webinar is Gavin and uh, my name, name is Evie Jewett and I'll be hosting the webinar. And uh, we're going to be talking about how to manage several common invasive plant species that are found in Pennsylvania. And also we'll be talking about how to record your treatment efforts in the IMAP invasive seed debate. So the agenda for uh, our webinar today, we're going to be talking about the common invasive species in Pennsylvania. Uh, there'll be five uh, specifically that we'll be talking about. Uh, also, we'll be discussing about the species. We're make sure that you know uh, that you're looking at the target invasive species and maybe uh, not necessarily a lookalike species, so we'll be talking about that. And then we'll be going over each of the five invasive species that um, I've highlighted during this training. Uh, we'll be discussing management recommendations and also going over um, the distributions of these species in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, if everyone could please mute their microphone with the background noise, uh, that would be really appreciated to so make sure you're muted. Thank you. To prevent the reestablishment of an invasive plant species once you manage it. We'll be talking about how to document your treatment efforts in IMAP invasives and then how to query for that information uh, also in the IMAP program. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, we do have a lot of non-native invasive species that are invading the natural and pristine lands of our state. But, and unfortunately, none of these species come with a red flag that help us to pinpoint them in our landscape. So it's really important for us to know how to identify these species amidst the valuable native species that are present in our natural areas. And also it's really important for us to understand the best manager practices that we can implement in order to um, appropriately and effectively the measures. So the following is a, a short list of some of these uh, common invasive species and the ones that we'll be focusing on throughout this training. So again, there's five species that we'll be talking about. There's many others that are out there, but these are the five that we'll be talking about today. So Tree of Heaven is the first, Japanese Barberry, Autumn Olive, Multiflora Rose, and Japanese Knotweed. Uh, for a more in-depth listing of some of the other common invasive species that are found in Pennsylvania, I would encourage you to check out a brochure that was made by the uh, DCNR called Invasive Plants of Pennsylvania. And once uh, this, this uh, training wraps up, uh, I'll be sending everyone a link to this story map, and you'll be able to access that brochure just by clicking here on this hyperlink. So you'll be able to have access to all those, all the resources that I'll be talking about in the story map today. Again, if everyone could please mute the microphone. I still hear some background noise. I would really appreciate that. It's a little hard to, um, to go through the webinar if everyone isn't muted, so please make sure to mute your microphone. And here's just some pictures of what um, some of these species look like. So left to right, this is Tree of Heaven, Japanese Barberry, Autumn Olive, Multiflora Rose, and Japanese Knotweed. When managing any invasive species, it's really important to be aware of similar look-alike species and ensure that you are actually treating your species. Uh, and so for more information about species that resemble the five invasive plants that we'll be discussing during this training, <coughs> you to check out these uh, fact sheets that are provided by Penn State Extension. There's a look-alike section in each one of them. And uh, again, once you have a link to the story map, you'll be able to click on them. So I'll just bring one up real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is a fact sheet that was put together by Penn State Extension for Heaven. And if you scroll down, um, you'll see a section called look-alike where you can learn more something that can be sometimes confused with. And you can do that for any of these species that I listed here. These hyperlinks take you right to those um, uh, fact sheets. So here's just an example to, to show you 
um, autumn olive, which is one of the species we'll be talking about today, that uh, can clearly resemble another invasive species. Like the <laughs> and one way to get these apart is by looking at their fruit. And so autumn olive has a really bright uh, mottled red fruit, which we can see here in the top picture, uh, compared to Russian olive, which has a um, green mealy fruit. So that's a really distinctive way to be able to tell, tell them apart. Um, so just keep that in mind. Again, some of these species, they do resemble others, but there are ways to tell them apart. So the next section of our training, we'll be talk talking uh, about the overviews for each of the five species we'll be talking about and their band recommendations. But I do have some notes that I want to make sure I mention before we get into that section. So uh, any of the management recommendations or all, all the management recommendations that are being provided during this training uh, are for informational purposes only and are not necessarily an endorsement by the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives Program. And also there may be additional management strategies for each of these five species that are highlighted in this training, but uh, for purposes of time, we're only going to be talking about manual, mechanical, chemical, and biological controls. Uh, so again, there might be some other ways to manage some of these species that are not necessarily me uh, mentioned here in the training, um, but again, for time's sake, we're just kind of limiting it to, to these particular categories. And for anyone on the webinar today, if you have follow-up that's directly related to best management practices for these species, I would encourage you to directly contact either the DCNR or Penn State Extension. Uh, these are really great resources and uh, have a lot of expertise on how to manage these species. And the IMAP Invasives Program uh, is simply just providing this information uh, from these two trusted sources. We are not necessarily an expert in this field. So again, for any specific questions for, for management um, practices, please contact either DCNR or Penn State Extension directly. Uh, so we're going to first talk about Tree of Heaven, and I'm going to show a short video from Penn State Extension that's going to talk about this species. I'm going to go ahead and get that, that video started here. Tree of Heaven, Alanthus Epitoma, also referred to as simply Alanthus, is a rapidly growing exotic invasive tree native to Asia. It was first introduced into the United States in the late 1700s and has since become an aggressive invasive species that can quickly overwhelm roadside fields and natural areas displacing native plants. Tree of Heaven tolerates a wide variety of sites and moisture conditions. From fertile soils on rivers and streams to rocky drought prone soils on ridge top abandoned mines. It is commonly found growing on disturbed sites such as roadsides, as well as forest edges, fence rows, and in forest openings. Tree of Heaven is a rapidly growing, relatively short lived tree. It can grow to a large size with mature trees between 8 feet in height and 6 feet in diameter. Tree of Heaven is in meaning that between central and with multiple leaves with them. Tree of Heaven leaves range in length from four feet, anywhere from 10 to 50 leaves. This image of the Tree of Heaven leaves next to a yardstick for perspective. The margins or edges of each leaflet are smooth or what is referred to as entire. At the base of each leaflet, you will find one or two bumps known as glandular teeth. When crushed, the leaves emit a distinct offensive odor that can compare to cat urine or burnt peanut butter. The bark of tree of heaven is light brown to gray, resembling the skin of a cantaloupe. As the tree ages, the bark turns darker gray and becomes rough. The twigs of tree of heaven are alternate on the tree. They are stout, green to brown in color, with small lateral buds and lack a terminal bud at the end of the twig. The twigs have large V or heart-shaped leaf scars. The leaf scars they are exposed when the leaf falls from the stem. Lateral buds are located at the top of each leaf scar as seen in this image. The twigs can be easily broken to expose the large, spongy brown center or pit. It emits the same unpleasant odor as the crushed leaves. Tree of 
tree of heaven is dioecious, which means the tree is either male, male grows in colonies alone. All trees are born on female trees, long, twisted, samara, or wind. There's one seed, samara. The samaras are found in clusters, may on trees and marshes. Individual samaras eventually fall to the ground, assisted by gravity and wind. To summarize, the distinguishing characteristics of tree of heaven include innately compound leaves, leaflets with smooth edges and glandular teeth at the base, distinctive unpleasant odor, bark resembling the skin of a cantaloupe, stout greenish-brown twigs that have a spongy brown tip, and seeds and twisted samaras that remain on the female tree into the winter. By using these key characteristics, you'll be able to identify tree of heaven on your property as well as across the landscape. Okay, so that was a great overview by Dave Jackson from Penn State Extension on Tree of Heaven. And next we'll be talking about um, management recommendations for how to control this species. And the information that's being provided as far as how to manage this species is, being, is coming from the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and also Penn State Extension. So elimination of Tree of Heaven uh, can be difficult and time consuming due to its abundancy, high germination rate, and frequent root sprouts. While young tree of heaven seedlings can be pulled or dug up, the chance of getting all root fragments can be difficult and can lead to root sprouts. Seedlings can be confused with root suckers, which are nearly impossible to remove effectively by hand. Cutting tree of heaven is not recommended as this will encourage the tree to send up large numbers of root sprouts and suckers, creating a bigger problem than before. The most effective way to treat Tree of Heaven is with herbicides. Foliar application of triclopyr or glyphosate mixed with water and a non-ionic surfactant is effective on smaller trees when applied between June and late August. For larger trees, application of triclopyr or glyphosate with the basal bark, hack and squirt, or injection should work effectively. Cut stump herbicide application, however, may encourage root suckering. Application rates may vary, so see the references provided in DCNR's Tree of Heaven fact sheet for more specific information. And finally, follow-up monitoring and treatment are very important to effectively control Tree of Heaven. And regardless of the control method used, treated areas should be checked one or more times a year. Uh, and then as far as distribution for Tree of Heaven in Pennsylvania, uh, here's a map showing uh, where it's been found so far by county. So we can see it is really prevalent in our state. Um, and this is information to put together this distribution map was pulled from data from IMAP Invasive, the Pennsylvania Flora Project of North Arboretum, and, and the Biota of, the, of North America program. Okay, the next species we're going to talk about is Japanese barberry. Again, we're going to watch another video uh, that we put together by Penn State Extension. Japanese barberry is an invasive shrub first introduced to the United States in the late 1800s. They can now be found from Maine to North Carolina and as far west as Nebraska. Japanese barberry was historically used in living fences for livestock and for weapons, but it's now used primarily as an ornamental hedge built in many nurseries and garden centers. Japanese barberry is a compact, dense shrub, rarely exceeding four feet in height. It blooms in spring with creamy yellow, six petal flowers appearing in groups of two to four. The leaves grow in clusters and are distinctly spoon shaped with smooth edges. They are thick, leathery, and bright green, but can be tinged with red or purple and grow up to an inch in length. The leaves emerge earlier in spring and are held later in fall than most native deciduous forest plants. Additionally, the fall foliage is vibrant orange. These two traits make them simple spot in spring and late fall. Also in fall, Japanese barberry is known for its distinctive red berry, which can hang singly or in clusters of up to four, with each berry being about a quarter of an inch long. Japanese barberry stems are deeply grooved and rusty brown with single spines one half inch or less in length. 
The inner bark is a vibrant yellow green. This plant colonizes a broad range of sites, displacing a wide variety of native plants, especially herbaceous spring ephemeral. And since it is highly adaptive, it can grow in place of shade and from wet to dry soil conditions. Given enough individuals in an area, their leaf litter can shift the pH of the soil, making it more basic, thus further excluding many native plant species. of its foliage creates a humid environment favorable for Japanese barberry spreads by both seed and vegetative meat. The berries are eaten by birds and mammals from late summer through winter, with the seeds being spread to new areas in their droppings. Individual barberry plants can also spread horizontally by a process called layering. This is when royal New plants created in this way survive being severed from their parent herring can be similar to Japanese barberry, native Allegheny barberry, and European barberry. Both resemble Japanese barberry closely, with the major exception being their spines. Where Japanese barberry has single spines, the other two species produce three pronged spines. Allegheny barberry also has leaves with coarse serration or teeth along the edges of the leaf. Familiarize yourself with Japanese barberry identification traits in all four seasons spring, summer, fall, and winter, and take appropriate control measures to stop its spread. Despite Japanese barberry's ornamental value, Think twice before finding a native species. It can quickly take over most sites, forcing out many valuable native plants, and once established, it can be difficult to remove. Okay, another really nice overview by Dave Jackson from um, Penn State Extension on this particular species, Rhodopanese barberry. Now we're going to move on to talking about some of the management recommendations, and this information is being provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Barberry is easy to identify in spring because it is one of the first shrubs to leaf out. Using thick gloves, small plants can be pulled by hand while larger plants should be dug up. Be sure to remove the entire root system and bag and dispose of any plant material, including fallen fruits. Mowing or cutting is not advisable when managing Japanese barberry, except to make removal easier. This plant is sensitive to fire. Prescribed burns and weed torches are good options. Systemic herbicides such as glyphosate and triclopyr are effective in managing barberry. Herbicide can be applied as a basal bark or cut stump application. Late summer during the fruiting may be the best time to apply herbicide, but early spring applications may avoid non-target impacts. Large thickets of barberry can be controlled with foliar spray applications. Triclopyr only targets broadly species, but glyphosate is non-selective. Okay, and here is a map showing the current distribution of Japanese barberry by county in Pennsylvania. Uh, very widespread, according to this map. Again, the sources that were drawn from to create this map are IMAP Invasive, PA Flora, and the Biota of North America program. Okay, moving on to our third species, autumn olive. Again, we're going to watch another video by Penn State Extension to uh, give an overview of this species. Autumn olive is an invasive ornamental shrub native to Asia. It was first introduced to North America in the mid 1800s. The silvery foliage, showy flowers, and colorful berries made it popular in landscaping was also planted extensively in natural areas to provide erosion control, wind breaks, and wildlife food. Autumn olive is a rapidly growing multi-stem shrub that can reach heights of up to 20 feet and spread 30 feet wide. Its leaves are elongated with smooth edges or margins and arranged alternately along the stem. Each are two to four inches in length with a pale green upper surface and a white underside due to the presence of silvery scales. Autumn olive has trumpet-shaped flowers, 
which bloom in the spring and range from white to pale yellow in color. Each flower is one half to three quarters of an inch in size with four petals arranged in clusters of four to six. In late summer, clusters of brilliant red emerge, each up to one half inch in diameter and flecked with silvery scales. Later in the season, the fruit may darken slightly and appear browner. When open, they reveal a single seed. Olive stems are ashy brown, but silvery scales are especially prominent on young stems, which sometimes appear gray. The stem also bears sharp, stout spines. Autumn olives spread through seed dispersal, primarily by birds. The fruit persists through fall before drying up and falling off the plant is not consumed. Unlike many native shrub species, autumn olive matures quickly and can produce wild seeds in as few as three years. Though abundant, the fruits are of low nutritional value to wildlife in comparison to the native shrub species they often replace. From the East Coast and as far west as Minnesota, autumn olive is an aggressive invader of roadside, pastures, abandoned agricultural land, forest edges, and other disturbed habitats. It is intolerant of dense shade and commonly found on disturbed sites with full to partial sun. Autumn olive is tolerant of salinity, extreme pH, and heavy metals, traits which enable it to survive or thrive on poor sites, including highway roadsides, mine spoil, and other post-industrial sites. Autumn olive has one notable like Russian olive, which is also a non-native invasive shrub that is nearly identical to autumn olive. Though they have some differences, most notably their green mealy fruit in contrast to the bright mild red fruit of autumn olive. The species are ecologically very similar and require the same controlled treatment. Autumn olive spreads aggressively and grows quickly, enabling it to take over native plant communities. Be sure to learn how to identify the non-native invasive shrub before applying control measures. Okay. And we'll move on to the management recommendations uh, provided for autumn olive. This information is coming from the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Young seedlings of autumn olive can be pooled by hand when the soil is moist enough to ensure complete removal of the root system. Small saplings can be pulled sufficiently with a weed wrench. Larger individuals can be cut at ground level or girdled. Cutting is an initial control measure and should be followed by herbicide treatment to prevent re-sprouting. Use a systemic herbicide such as glyphosate or triclopyr to treat autumn olives. Herbicides should be applied immediately to cut stumps to prevent regeneration. It can also be applied to girdle wounds or directly to the lower bark using the basal bark method. Large thickets where risk to non-target species is minimal can be controlled by the foliar spray method. And here's the uh, current known distribution of autumn olive by county in Pennsylvania. Again, this, the, this map was created using uh, data from IMAP Invasives, Pennsylvania Flora, and the Biota of North America program. Okay, our four species we'll talk about is multiflora rose. Again, we'll watch a video here made by Penn State Extension. <laughs> Multiflora rose is an invasive shrub introduced into the United States from East Asia in the mid-1800s. It was originally used as rootstock for ornamental roses and widely planted for living fences, erosion control, and to provide food and cover for wildlife. Multiflora rose is listed as a Class B noxious weed by the state of Pennsylvania, a designation which prohibits its sale and acknowledges a widespread infestation that cannot effectively be eradicated. Like other plants with attractive flowers, multiflora rose persists in a due to unwillingness to remove plants perceived as having aesthetic value or value to pollinators and other wildlife. Contrary to that belief, the dense thickets created by multiflora rose displace native plant communities, reducing plant and wildlife diversity. Multiflora rose has pinnately compound leaves, meaning they have a central stem in which leaflets are attached. Each leaf has between five and nine leaflets and a uniquely fringed base or stipule where it connects to the stem. 
At one to two inches long, each leaflet is football shaped and noticeably chewed or serrated along the edges. The leaves are usually green, but new growth and the stipules can be spotted with pink or red. While very similar in appearance to other native and exotic rose species, multiflora rose is unique in having fringe stipules at the base of the leaf. The stems or canes are vibrant olive green year round making them easy to distinguish from native roses, raspberries, and blackberries. Each cane is round and bears characteristic rose thorns or prickles. From May to June, clusters of showy fragrant blossoms emerge along the cane. Flowers are five petals, white or pale pink, and a bright yellow pollen. In midsummer, the fruit, called rose tips, replace the flowers and persist through winter often into the next growing season. They are one quarter inch in diameter, shiny, and initially a showy red, but darken over time. This shrub thrives on poor growing sites. It prefers full sun to moderate shade, and is often found in abandoned fields, hedgerows, and along forest edges and roadsides. It can also survive in the deep shade of a mature forest. While it tolerates most sites, regardless of light, moisture, salinity, or pH, it is not tolerant of extreme cold and will die below negative 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Multiflora rose reproduces by seed, root sprouts, and a vegetative process called layering. Layering occurs when seeding the soil, produces roots, and becomes independent from the parent plant. The fruit is available to birds year-round as black seeds are commonly found in the new flower. Once deposited in a new location via bird dropping, the seeds can persist and remain viable in the soil for up to 20 years, often germinating when the site is disturbed. Multiflora rose can be easily confused with native roses such as pasture rose, swamp rose, and Virginia rose. However, all native roses have pink flowers, and smooth or entire stipules. Native black raspberry and Allegheny blackberry, both native to Pennsylvania, have common leaves, thorns, similar growth habits, and a tendency to form thickets, but usually have red or purplish canes rather than the consistent olive green of multiflora rose. And the fruit is much different from a rose. Another exotic invasive cane forming shrub, which could be mistaken for rose, is wineberry, but its canes are thickly covered in pink hairs rather than prickles or thorns. Control of multiflora rose requires the ability to positively identify it from other flora and native lookalikes. Despite its ornamental value and falsely reported wildlife benefits, this aggressive invasive plant needs to be controlled to prevent it from taking over natural areas and displacing native plants. Okay, and now we'll move on to the management recommendations for multiflora rose. Again, these uh, recommendations are being provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Frequent cutting or mowing three to six times per growing season for two to four years is effective in achieving high mortality of multiflora rose. But be careful, the strong thorns have been known to puncture rubber tires. Scattered populations may be eliminated by complete removal of the plants. Be sure to remove all root material because multiflora rose readily resprout. In areas where this shrub is detected early, prescribed fire may limit its establishment. Application of herbicides such as glyphosate or triclopyr on freshly cut stems is an effective control method since it destroys the root system and prevents resprouting. This may be done during the dormant period, which reduces the likelihood of damaging desirable species. A foliar spray of fosamine can be used from July through September, but dieback will not be apparent until the following summer. Fosamine will only affect woody species. Biological control is currently under investigation. Rose rosette disease, a native viral pathogen, is spread by a mite and is slowly spreading eastward from the west. The European rose psyllid, a seed infesting wasp, promises to reduce seed viability. Unfortunately, both of these measures have the potential to impact native rose species. 
And here's a distribution map showing the current known distribution of multiflora rose uh, in Pennsylvania. Again, very, very widespread. And data is used to create this map, just like the others, was pulled from IMAP invasives, PA flora, and the Biota of North America program. And the last species that we'll talk about today is Japanese knotweed, and we'll watch this video real quick just to get an overview of the species by the extension. The invasive plant, Japanese knotweed, an herbaceous perennial member of the buckwheat family, was first introduced from East Asia in the late 1800s as an ornamental and to stabilize stream banks. Now, Japanese knotweed is a highly successful invader across a wide geographic range, most commonly colonizing stream and river corridors, forest edges, roadsides, and drainage ditches. Similar in appearance, ecology, behavior, and control requirements are this plant's close relatives, giant knotweed and bohemian knotweed, Knotweed infestation in both plant and animal degrade soil and water quality. And the presence of knotweed on your property may also decrease its value. Training yourself to positively identify knotweed is the first step in being able to control this tenacious invasive plant. Let's examine the identification characteristics of both Japanese and giant knotweed. Emerging in early spring, the young growth of knotweed is often bright red or purple and tipped with many furled leaves, which are distinctly triangular. Mature knotweed has many ultimately arranged spade or heart-shaped leaves emerging from nodes along the stem. The lower leaves are often the plant grows, leaving the like stem there. Japanese knotweed leaves can be up to six inches long and have a squared leaf face. Giant or hybrid knotweed leaves will grow much larger, up to a foot in length, and have a rounded leaf base. In late summer, white or pale green flower clusters sprout from the nodes. These upright, finger-like clusters consist of several dozen tiny, high-petaled, aromatic flowers. The stems are jointed and hollow, with red or purple nodes where the leaves attach. They are otherwise smooth, bright green, and often covered with darker spots or streaks. Portions of the upper stem appear to zigzag from node to node. The dense, low canopy formed by their thicket of tangled stems and large leaves creates monoculture, excluding nearly all other vegetation. Compared to native streamside vegetation, knotweed is much less effective at controlling erosion, and its presence along streams gradually degrades aquatic habitat and water quality. Be aware, knotweed is sometimes Fused with another invasive plant, bamboo. But bamboo has slender, deep leaves which persist year round. Bamboo stems are also jointed and hollow but are tough and woody, while living knotweed stems are herbaceous and will be wet when cut. The first step in controlling knotweed on your property is positive identification. To review, be on the lookout for bright red or purple young growth of knotweed in early spring and alternately arranged sometimes zigzagging spade or heart-shaped leaves in mature stands. In late summer, knotweed will have white or pale green flower clusters sprouting from the nose. Once you have positively identified Japanese knotweed or its close relatives, it is time to start control measures against this aggressive invasive plant. Okay, and that was a great overview of Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed. Um, and now we'll talk about the management recommendations for this species. Again, this information is being provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. So the key to successful knotweed management is controlling the rhizome. Treating Japanese knotweed with mechanical methods alone are largely ineffective. It may be possible to grab or pull single plants if they are not well established and soil conditions allow for complete rhizome removal. However, small portions of the rhizome system that are not removed have the potential to re-sprout. The herbaceous stems of knotweed can be cut or mowed quite easily. Cutting alone will not control the plant, but when performed after June 1st will significantly reduce the height of the regrowth. Several herbicides such as like they are actually controlling Japanese knotweed. If the plants grow in a wetland, be sure to use an aquatic-approved herbicide. Also, be sure to check label directions and state requirements. Foliar herbicide applications made after July 1st 
and before the first killing frost are most effective at injuring the rhizome. During this time, carbohydrates produced in the leaves of Japanese knotweed are moved to the rhizomes for growth and storage. Foliar applied herbicides move through the plant with the carbohydrates. And here's a map showing the distribution of Japanese knotweed by county in Pennsylvania. And just like the other maps, this also was created using IMAP invasive data, Pennsylvania flora data, and also the Biota of North America program data. Okay, so that's an overview of the, the five species that we'll be talking about in today's training, as well as their management recommendations. Uh, there are some additional resources I wanted to point out, and again, you guys will have access to this once I send you a link to the story map after today's webinar training. The Penn State Extension also put together two other really great videos that talk specifically about control strategies, uh, one for a tree of heaven, and the other for multiflora rows. And so I would encourage you to check those out. They'll give you a lot more really good information and if you'd like to treat these species. And if you're interested in more information on management recommendations for the other three species that we talked about today, again, there's lots of really good information online. I would certainly recommend looking into DCNR, Penn State Extension. Those are two really great resources to check out. So preventing the reestablishment of invasive plants is really important whenever you are doing any kind of management, management regime. So after completion of management efforts for these and other invasive species, it's often a good idea to plant other vegetation, preferably native species, to prevent reestablishment of the invasive plants that you just managed. So for example, once Japanese knotweed is removed from an area, replanting other vegetation is a must in order to prevent reestablishment of the species. So um, you can view DCNR as landscaping with native plants for sure to learn which native plants will do well in an area. Thank you. Uh, so this for sure includes lists of species that are categorized by what type of site they will thrive in, uh, including sunny moist sites, sunny dry sites, shady moist sites, and shady dry sites. Okay, so next we're going to move on to talking about how to document treatment efforts in IMAP invasive. And we'll first talk a little bit about what is IMAP invasive. So the IMAP invasive database is a free to use online platform that provides an easy way to document and share location and management details for invasive species. This unique platform preserves your data in a publicly accessible place for future use by yourself as well as other registered users of uh, IMAP. So to begin uh, documenting your treatment efforts in, I in IMAP Invasive, you'll first have to register for a free login account. And in order to do so, you can visit either imapinvasive.org or paimapinvasive.org and click on the login button on either website to sign up. Or alternatively, you can click on this blue button here once you have access to the story map and it will take you to where you can sign up uh, for a login account as well. So some important notes to remember when you are wanting to enter treatment data into IMAP Invasive. So at this time, treatment information cannot be recorded using IMAP. It can only be recorded using the online version of IMAP Invasive. Uh, which is accessible on a desktop, a laptop, oh, no tablet, or a mobile device. Uh, when creating a you know record in IMAP Invasive, you must first create one or more presence records. And essentially, any treatment record in IMAP Invasive will need to encomp encompass at least one data point that signifies the presence of a particular invasive species that was later treated. And other participating jurisdictions in the IMAP Invasive program uh, only allow some of their users to enter treatment data, and this is due to privacy concerns that they have that restricted. However, in the Pennsylvania portion of the IMAP program, all of our registered users are given the ability to enter treatment data. So just a reminder, uh, please mute your microphone so that there isn't any background noise on the webinar. That'd be really appreciated. Okay. So we'll just move on. Here's the steps for how to enter treatment data into IMAP. So once you're logged in, uh, you're going to zoom to the area on the map where you conducted your treatment effort, 
and you can modify the base map in IMAP to uh, more easily find your location. Uh, so it's generally set to, I believe, topographic, uh, and you can change to a satellite view, which will look like this picture here on the screen where you can see the aerial view of the land. It sometimes makes finding your location of treatment a little bit easier. And then in the menu on the right side of your screen, which is here, you're going to want to turn on the confirmed presences and approximate present species layers. And in doing this, it will help you to locate uh, the species and the area that you treated. So once you do those two things, you're going to want to then click on the Create Record button, which is at the top of your screen, and uh, click the Treatment option. Uh, next, you're going to select all the species that you treated at that particular location. And you're going to select one or more species from the drop down list by typing either in their, their common or scientific name. Both will work just fine. And once you've uh, selected all the species that you've treated, you can go ahead and click the next button. Now you're going to select what shape you would like your treatment record to look like in IMAP, and you can choose from either a polygon, a point, or a line. Uh, and that's always going to depend based on the uh, size of the area that you were treating, if it was large or small, and if it was along a corridor. So if it was along like a river bank, maybe you'd want to draw a line for that reason, or, or perhaps along like a hiking track, maybe you want to draw a line. Um, all other instances, probably if you have a large area that you're treating, you'll probably want to create a polygon, or if it's a very small area, you'll probably want to just create a point. So for purposes of this training, we'll be uh, drawing a polygon. So to draw your treatment operation, you click and drop vertices one at a time to form your polygon. Uh, then you'll double click to finish drawing your shape. Uh, and there are options, as you can see here in uh, the screenshot, uh, to redraw or edit. So use those as needed to redraw or edit your polygon to make sure that it's the shape and size that you want it to be. And once you're happy with that, then you can click the next button to go on to the, uh, the next step. Uh, now you're going to fill in the pertinent information about your treatment effort. And there's several data fields that are available, including the treatment begin and end date, uh, whether it was an initial or follow-up treatment iteration, the lead contact person that was in charge of that treatment effort, and that person's organization. Uh, what the goals were for your treatment effort and the options to uh, choose from are eradication, containment, and suppression. You can include any comments that are applicable to your treatment effort. You can include information about rare species precautions that you took while, while conducting your treatment. Uh, you can uh, enter information about permit comments, uh, photos of treated area, photos of the treated area, whether or not your treatment was part of a particular IMAP invasive project, and also if there was a local contact person that you worked with when you were making or when you were conducting the treatment effort. So required fields that you will have to fill in in this part of the data entry interface are going to be marked with a red asterisk, so make sure that you're filling those in. If it's not marked with a red asterisk, that means that it's optional and you don't have to fill it in if you don't want to. So then when you're finished with this section, you want to click the next button to go on to the next part. And now you're going to choose your treatment type. And the options that you have available to you are physical, chemical, or biological. For purposes of this training, we're using chemical. And then again, you're going to be presented with a bunch of different data fields. And you'll want to fill in the pertinent details uh, of you know, using the data fields that are given to you that describe how you went about managing your target invasive species. Uh, and several data fields are provided, so fill in only those that are relevant to your specific treatment effort. If something is listed that isn't relevant to what you did, go ahead and leave that blank. And depending on which treatment type you chose, again, the options were physical, chemical, or biological, uh, the data fields that are presented <coughs> excuse me, will be slightly different. And so because we chose chemical here, the data fields that, that popped up are all relative to a chemical treatment effort. <clears throat> and so when you're finished with this section, you're going to want to click on the next button. And now a summary is provided of all the details that you just entered that describe your treatment efforts. So make sure to review that summary very carefully to ensure all the information is accurate. And if you need to, click on the back button, which is located down here uh, on the data entry interface. 
to go back to any section and change whatever field you might need to change. And then when you're ready, go ahead and click that complete button. <clears throat> so once you hit complete um, and you're finished doing your data entry, you'll be presented with a summary box that includes your treatment records relevant ID numbers. And those are going to include two specific numbers, a searched area record number, which is an auto-generated record for every single record that gets entered into IMAP. And it's also, you're also going to be given uh, the treatment record ID number for the record that you just created. And so you can click on either one of these record numbers to go directly to the record details. And the record number is a hyperlink, which allows you to go easily back and forth and, and look at that information. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So here on the, the right-hand side, the bigger picture, this is a view of what the, the record will look like for that auto-generated searched area record. And this record, um, you can't see the whole thing here just because of screen space, but the record has more information if you would scroll down if you were actually in the database itself. And same thing for the treatment record, which is here on the left, just a little bit smaller. There is more information available, and so you can um, access that and look at the information. And so once you've gone ahead and created your treatment record, you'll probably want to be able to go back in IMAP at some point and view your treatment records. And so there's several ways that you can go uh, about going into the database and finding your treatment records. So the first way is to create a custom query. The second way is to locate records using the Zoom feature on the map. Or you can also use the Find Record tool. And we're going to talk about each of those options here one by one. So the first option, if you'd like to go in and create a custom query to find your treatment records, this option will allow you to see only the treatment records that you have created. So to create a custom query, you're first going to need to log into IMAP Invasives, again, by going to either imapinvasives.org or paimapinvasives.org and clicking on the login button. And then once you're logged in, you're going to want to find the button at the top of your screen that says filter records. <sighs> And then you'll go ahead and click on that. Ooh. Once you click on that button, you're going to select the toggle button at the top of the query screen that says filter on your records. And when that toggle is activated, the color of the toggle switch will change from gray to green. So when it's, when it's green, you know that it's activated. And once you've done that, then you'll go ahead and click the apply filter button. So once you do that, again, if folks could please mute their microphone. That would be really helpful so there's no background noise. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next in the menu options on the right side of your screen, you're going to want to select the layers on off section. And in that section, you're going to turn the treatment layers on. And once you do this, now you should see some brown dots appear on the map. And the brown dots, uh, if you would open up the legend, are indicative of treatment records. Uh, and just a hint, in order to help the treatment layer draw more quickly on the map, I would encourage you to turn off any other layers, because sometimes there's a lot of things trying to draw at the same time. It can, it can, it can take a while. So just make sure that you're only uh, looking at the treatment layer, and it should draw more quickly. Also, just a quick note, if no brown dots appear on the map after you've done uh, this everything that we've talked about so far, it probably means that you don't have any treatment records already in the database. So this, again, is only going to work if you've already created some treatment data in IMAP. So once you've done this, then you're going to want to use the, the plus button that's on the left side of your screen to zoom in closer to one of your treatment records that pops up on the map. And then once you reach your desired zoom level, you'll click on one of the brown points, lines, or polygons, which essentially is one of your treatment records. And then you'll notice a table that appears at the bottom of your screen. You can see that here in this screenshot here on the left. Uh, it will have one or more rows of information that indicate the specific treatment record that you just clicked on. And you can't see it here in this screenshot, but there's a button in that row in the table called Details. And if you click on that details button, it will open your desired treatment record and you can look at its information. And just a hint, once you're actually in your treatment record, you can view additional information about it by clicking on the go to searched area page 
which is a hyperlink located inside your treatment record, and it will link you to your search area record that was, uh, that was auto-generated when you made your treatment record. So both of those records have information about your treatment um, uh, effort, so just keep that in mind. So that's how you create a custom query. The next option that we'll talk about as far as looking for treatment records in IMAP is using the Zoom tool. So this option will allow you to view treatment records you created as well as records that are created by others. So you can look up all treatment records, essentially. So it's easy to find a treatment record using the Zoom feature. All you need to know is, in general, where the treatment was located on the map. So to begin, again, you're going to want to make sure that you're logged in to IMAP Invasive, and you're going to turn on the treatments layer on the map and wait to see a bunch of brown dots appear, kind of like we just did in, in the above um, uh, section in the custom query. And again, just a hint, make sure that you're only having the treatment layer draw and not have a bunch of other layers on as this is going to slow things down. Uh, so make sure you just have one layer on at a time. Uh, next, you're going to zoom into the map using that plus button on the left side of your screen. And once you zoom into the area where your desired treatment uh, record is located, you're going to follow the same steps outlined above in the custom query in order to open your record and view its details. So essentially, this, in this step, you're just turning on all the treatment records that are um, located in, in our state. And then you'll just zoom into the map so you find the one that you're looking for is, is basically what this step is all about. And then just as a, another hint, there's another really neat tool in IMAP that I just want to give a, a brief overview about. So when you have multiple treatment records that are located near each other on the map, you might want to look at them together in a table format rather than clicking on each record one at a time. So in order to view multiple records at once, you can use a tool called the Identify Measure button, which is located at the top of your screen. It's right here. It's grayed out right now on this screenshot, but that's where it's at. So if you click on that Identify Measure button, um, you can then draw a polygon around all the treatment records that you're interested in. Um, and, and you'll do that by clicking this Area button inside that tool. And then once you draw that polygon, there's another button that you'll click down that says see what's here, which is right here. That's what it looks like. And once you do that, then a table will appear at the bottom of your screen with all of the lassoed, essentially, records that you just put inside that, that polygon that you drew. So essentially, if you have a bunch of treatment records, like five or ten treatment records that you want to look at all at the same time in a table, this Identify Measure tool allows you, to do, uh, allows you to do that very easily. And then you can click on any of those records details by clicking that Details button. Uh, it just it kind of simplifies the process and speeds it up a little bit more. And then finally, there's uh, the option to use a Find Record tool. Um, this is essentially just you looking up uh, the record number for your treatment um, record that you created. And so this is an option that allows you to view treatment records that you created as well as records that were created by others. So if you know your treatment records ID number, you can easily query for it in IMAP Invasive. Um, and just a note, the treatment ID number is displayed directly after a treatment record is created in IMAP. If you remember that, we just talked about that um, in some of the steps we just listed above. And for purposes of querying using this method, the find record method, you'll need to have jotted down that treatment ID number already. So to query using that, that specific treatment ID number, you'll need to be logged into IMAP and then click on the button near the top of your screen that says find record, which is right here, and select treatment as the type, and then enter in that ID number in the record ID number and click find. And then once you do that, the map will zoom to the record that you just looked up, and a table will appear at the bottom of your screen that has information about that record. And again, just like some of the other methods we've talked about, that details button will appear, and you can look at that uh, treatment records information more closely. So those are the three ways that you can query for information. Uh, and that uh, wraps up the uh, webinar for today. So we talked a about the five species, um, Tree of Heaven, uh, let's see if I can remember them all, Japanese barberry, autumn olive, multiflora rose, and Japanese knotweed. 
We talked about how to enter treatment data into IMAP, and we talked about how to query for it later on. So if anyone has any questions, um, we can take the remaining five minutes of time and please use the chat feature to type in your questions. Um, and we'll just kind of hang out here for the next few minutes and see if anyone does have questions that we can answer. Again, this training was recorded. So once we wrap up the webinar today, I'll be posting the uh, recording onto the Pennsylvania IMAP website and also sending that out to all of you so you can watch it later if you'd like. And I'll be sending a link uh, to this story map so you can scroll through this at your leisure and access some of those resources that I pointed out. Uh, so at this time, I will uh, just kind of open it up. And if anyone has any questions, again, please use the chat feature to ask your questions. And if you don't have any questions and you'd like to sign off, go ahead and, and sign off. And I say thank you for being part of today's webinar. Okay, and just um, for those of you that are asking questions on the chat, uh, some of the other Pennsylvania IMAP staff members are answering your questions also through the chat. So I won't be saying them um, verbally, so just look for an answer to your question that will probably show up in the next few minutes. Um, and again, if anyone does have any questions after today's training is over, my contact information is here. The best way to reach me right now is through email. My email address is ajewitt at paconserve.org, so please feel free to reach out to me that way. Uh, we'll just stay on for a few more minutes and see if any more questions come up. And again, uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions also using uh, the chat feature. So look for a typed answer to come back to you that way. Okay, so again, it looks like some more questions are coming in, uh, but for anyone that is, um, is finished, doesn't have any questions, please feel free to sign off at this time. Okay, so I think we are wrapping up. Uh, so for those of you left on the webinar, again, thank you for attending. And, and I'm gonna stop the recording and we're gonna end the webinar. So thanks everybody, have a good rest of your day.